Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. It's uh, Canadian Edition here, and today we are looking at a couple games I had in my Japanese tanks. I was driving the Chinu 2 and the Tasi. Uh, the Chinu 2 is a medium tank, and the Tasi is a anti-aircraft tank. So our first match here is on the Maginot line. And I'm just going to talk to you guys a little bit about Japanese tactics during the war. So I've done some research and I've made some notes here. So, first thing I want to talk about is how the Japanese organize their tanks. So, the Japanese usually have independence units for their tanks, which are attached to infantry commands as operational expediency dictates. So this practice can be expected to continue in view of the preponderant emphasis of Japanese tactical doctrine upon the decisive role of infantry, both in offense and defense. So the Japanese, like in places like Iwo Jima, they didn't really need mass tanks. They just placed them in spots where they could support the infantry. Um, large tank units still existed in the Japanese army, however, um, there is evidence of an increasing disposition to allocate them to higher echelon control. Um, so evidence indicates that the Japanese may have both the square and the triangular type of armor divisions. Um, the square type has a total estimated strength of 12,550 officers and enlisted men. <coughs> and uh, they would be equipped with around 2,000 vehicles or so. And uh, maybe 230 medium tanks and 170 light tanks within those 2,000 vehicles. So division headquarters would have a total personnel of uh, 500. The division would be organized into two brigades, each uh, having two tank regiments. And the strength of a tank regiment is about 920. Uh, the division also includes a mechanized infantry regiment with a strength of 2,900. Um, there's also a motorized artillery regiment of 1,200 officers and enlisted men. Um, this regiment would be armed with 75 millimeter field guns and 105 millimeter howitzers may also be included. Uh, the square division also has a number of units under direct division control. There's a reconnaissance unit, an engineer unit, an anti-tank unit with 47mm anti-tank guns and an anti-aircraft unit with 75mm anti-aircraft guns. So the Japanese definitely have... They definitely had a varied sense of armored divisions. They tried pretty much everything. Um, and it, was, it all seemed pretty standard. The problem was the equipment that they were using one thing that jumps out at me here is they had 2,000 vehicles, but only 230 of them were medium tanks. So here in this game, we're moving towards uh, the B point on the Maginot line. We're trying to defend the B point here in our Chi Nu. We're just peeking around the corner and trying to see if we find any enemies here. There's a close. Um, Close combat scenario. Japanese would use independent tank groups as well. Um, reconnaissance units would be used. They um, they had a lot of different regiments basically purpose-built, so it wasn't just like, hey, you guys, you guys do everything. They had uh, different regiments doing different specific tasks. As you can see, we put a shot into the side of the T-34 there, finish him off, but not after we take some damage. So we're going to replenish our crew and repair our tank. So the first tanks used by the Japanese army were of European manufacture. 
Um, British and French tank designs were British and French tank designs were adopted, and vehicles produced by Vickers, Hardin Lloyd, and Renault were used on a small scale by the Japanese armed forces until domestic manufacturing of armored vehicles began in 1929. So since the conclusion of the Tripart Pact on the 27th of September 1940, German tank designs apparently have been made available to the Japanese. And since the Nam Namunhan incident of 1939 on the Mongolia-Manchuria border, Soviet equipment likewise has been available for study by Japanese designers. So Japanese had quite an array of tank designs um, from the French, the British, the Germans, and the Russians. Pretty much everyone who makes good tanks. So combat with the forces of the United Nations had uh, offered another source for ideas relative to the design of Japanese tanks. There is no evidence, however, that the foreign principles of tank destruction have exercised a direct influence on Japanese design. So even though the Japanese had been exposed to all these kind of tanks, like either by using them um, with their with their units before or or being able to study them, they never there's never been any direct evidence of them utilizing this and and implementing it directly into their tank designs. So yeah, kind of strange. Japanese, when it comes to their armored vehicles, are very intriguing to me. They never really made anything good. They had a lot of good ideas, like this tank here was a prototype. Would have been a good tank if it was made. Um, they ordered some German Tigers, designated heavy tank number six for delivery, but they never got there. Um, so they had some good ideas, it just never came together. So despite these deficiencies of earlier models, uh, the design of efficient modern tanks, even heavy types, is not beyond the capabilities of the Japanese. They are familiar with the details of modern German models and have had an opportunity to observe American and British equipment. Limitations on the productive capacity of the Japanese industry impose the necessity of freezing tank models in order to attain a reasonably large volume of production. Nevertheless, it would be unwise to assume that the Japanese do not or will not have more effective armored vehicles than those encountered to date. Much heavier armor or the addition of spaced armor to the present armor can be expected in newer models. To compare with European and American standards, the armor of light tanks can be as much as 40 millimeters thick, that of medium tanks 75 millimeters. Heavy, heavy tanks would be expected to have up to 100 millimeters in thickness. Heavier armor in each case would be compensated for normally by the installation of wider tracks to reduce ground pressure. The equipment of medium tanks with a modern high velocity gun of at least 75 millimeter caliber would be imperative in any program of improving Japanese tank design. And the installation of coaxially mounted machine guns likewise could be anticipated. Pulse may be improved by a better employment of deflection angles and accessory equipment will be augmented particularly by the installation of two-way radios perhaps in every tank. So there is a lot of room for improvement in Japanese tank designs. That's what I take from that. They, just before they were defeated, they were, like I said, this one made it to the prototype stage. So if, if the war had gone on longer, we would have seen, and the Japanese weren't so, you know, cornered, and they were able to produce more, we probably would have seen some scary tanks, because they knew what was wrong with their vehicles, and they were trying to fix it. Um, they just didn't have the time. So we're moving forward in this game here, moving over to position A. We've got uh, B and C captured. So the Model 93 is one of the Japanese light tanks. It was, it was around in 1933, and it's an early example of the development of the light tank series. So the box type hull is divided into three compartments. The center compartment is the fighting compartment, the superstructure of which overhangs the tracks, 
the right hand side of the front of this compartment is extended forward to form a sponson for the ball mounted machine gun. In the forward compartment the driver would sit on the left and the gunner on the right. Suspension is by six small rubber tired bogey wheels and you can see on this tank it actually has that design. Mounted on three semi elliptical springs on each side there are three return rollers on each side and the drive is of front sprock sprocket tripe, uh, type. So one of the things we can see here, or at least I can see from the notes I've made, is the Japanese had a lot of ideas but were never able to really properly implement them until the war was over unfortunately. Um, one thing the Japanese did have going for them was a very strong navy and air force. Um, they weren't really known for their tanks. Their tanks kind of suffered. But their air force, they had the Zeros, among other vehicles, that were amazing. And the navy, they had the huge Japanese aircraft carriers and battleships. So, unfortunately, the armored vehicles of the Japanese suffered. It seems like most of their resources were forced, were uh, put towards the use of the Navy and the Air Force, which makes sense, because if you think about Japan, it's a coastal region. It's sort of a, a giant island, so it would make sense to have a strong Navy and um, Army or sorry, Air Force as opposed to Army, or Armored Vehicles especially. Not a whole lot going on in this game here. We were trying to shoot down a plane there, but we realized our gun actually couldn't point at the sky, which is odd. Even though it's a uh, Pinzel-mounted machine gun there, it looks like an anti-aircraft machine gun. We weren't really able to point it up as high as we would like, so it's a bit of a bummer. So we're heading towards B here. Not a whole lot going on. <laughs> we're driving in our Chinu 2. <coughs> we do have some damage to our tank as well as our crew, as you can see. Lots of scarecrows on this map, which is kind of funny. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about Japan and World War II and how it all came about. Um, the Empire of Japan entered World War II by launching a surprise offensive, which opened with the attack on Pearl Harbor at 7.48 a.m. Hawaiian time on December 7, 1941. Over the course of seven hours, there were coordinated Japanese attacks on the U.S. held Philippines, Guam, and Wake Island, and on the British Empire in Malaya, Singapore, and Hong Kong. The strategic goals of the offensive were to cripple the U.S. Pacific Fleet, capture oil fields in the Dutch East Indies, and expand the outer reaches of the Japanese Empire to create a formidable defensive perimeter around newly acquired territory. The decision by Japan to attack the United States remains controversial. Study groups in Japan had predicted ultimate disaster in a war between Japan and the US. And the Japanese economy was already straining to keep up with the demands from the war with China. However, the U.S. had placed an oil embargo on Japan, and Japan felt that the United States' demands were unacceptable. They felt cornered as we take a shot and go out of the match here. Facing an oil embargo by the United States, as well as dwindling domestic reserves, 
the Japanese government decided to execute a plan developed by the military branch, largely led by Osami Nagano and Isoroku Yamamoto, to bomb the United States naval base in Hawaii, thereby bringing the United States to World War II on the side of the Allies. So, if you didn't know, the United States didn't join the war until 1942, three years after the war had already begun, even though Canada was already fighting, Britain was already fighting, France was already fighting, all the nations of the Allies were basically fighting. Um, I'm not entirely sure if Russia was fighting at this point. But the US actually doesn't have as much involvement in World War II as anyone thinks. They only got involved because they were attacked. They didn't, you know, oh yeah, we'll help you guys. No, 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 no. They only joined because they were attacked. So, Canada actually did a lot more than the US in World War I and World War II. So on September 4th, 1941, the Japanese cabinet met to consider the war plans prepared by Imperial General Headquarters and decided, quote, our empire for the purpose of self-defense and self-preservation will complete preparations for war and is resolved to go to war with the United States, Great Britain, and the Netherlands if necessary. Our empire will concurrently take all possible diplomatic measures the United States via the United States and Great Britain, and thereby endeavor to obtain our objectives. In the event that there is no prospect of our demands being met by the first ten days of October through the diplomatic negotiations mentioned above, we will immediately decide to commence hostilities against the United States, Britain, and the Netherlands. Vice Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, the chief architect of the attack on Pearl Harbor, had strong misgivings about war with the United States. Yamamoto had spent time in the United States during his youth when he studied as a language student at Harvard University and later served as assistant naval attaché in Washington, D.C. Understanding the inherent dangers of war with the United States, Yamamoto warned his fellow countrymen, we can run wild for six months or maybe a year, but after that I have utterly no confidence. If you've ever seen the movie Letters to Iwo Jima, there's a character in that movie who um, represents Admiral Yamamoto. Um, I think he is Admiral Yamamoto in the movie. <laughs> uh, but what I'm trying to say is the uh, Japanese actor who plays him does a really good job. And... Um, Clint Eastwood directs a really good movie, and if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you check out uh, Letters to Iwo Jima. So the Imperial Japanese Navy made a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, Oha, Hawaii Territory, on Sunday morning, December 7th, 1941. The Pacific Fleet of the United States Navy and its defending Army Air Forces and Marine Air Forces sustained significant losses. The primary objective of the attack was to incapacitate the United States long enough for Japan to establish its long-planned Southeast Asian Empire and defensible buffer zones. However, as Admiral Yamamoto feared, the attack produced little lasting damage to the U.S. Navy with priority targets like the Pacific Fleet's aircraft carriers out at sea and vital shore facilities, whose destruction could have crippled the fleet on their own, were ignored. So for some reason, the aircraft carriers that the Japanese were targeting were actually on, out at sea that day, or that morning, so they weren't destroyed. And as they mentioned here, the vital um, shore facilities, like refueling or you know, the dry docks and stuff like that, they weren't targeted either. So if the Japanese had targeted those facilities, it would have surely crippled the Americans. Of a more serious consequence, the US public saw the attack as a treacherous act. 
and rallied against the Empire of Japan. Remember, remember, previously the United States didn't want to get involved with war. Their motto was, oh, it's not our problem. And the American public hadn't wanted nothing to do with it either. But now that Japan attacked them, everyone changed their minds. The United States entered the European theater and Pacific theater in full force. Four days later, Adolf Hitler of Germany and Benito Mussolini of Italy declared war on the United States, merging the separate conflicts. Following the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese launched offensives against Allied forces in East and Southeast Asia, with simultaneous attacks on British Hong Kong, British Malaya, and the Philippines. So that was it. They're all... <laughs> they've all gone to war. The Southeast Asian campaign was preceded by years of propaganda and espionage activities carried out in the region by the Japanese Empire. The Japanese polluted the region with their vision of greater Asian co-prosperity sphere and Asia for Asians. Many inhabitants in some of the colonies, particularly in Indonesia, actually sided with the Japanese invaders. Hong Kong surrendered to the Japanese on December 25th. In Malaya, the Japanese overwhelmed an allied army composed of British, Indian, Australian, and Malay forces. The Japanese were quickly able to advance down the Malayan Peninsula, forcing the allied forces to retreat towards Singapore. On February 15th, 1942, Singapore, due to the overwhelmingly superiority of Japanese forces and encirclement attacks, fell to the Japanese, causing the largest surrender of British-led military personnel in history. 80,000 Indian, Australian, British troops were taken as prisoners of war, joining 50,000 taken in the Japanese invasion of Malaya, which is now Malaysia. Many were later used as forced labor, constructing the Burma Railway, the site for the infamous bridge on the River Kwai. But immediately after their invasion, the Japanese purged the Chinese population in Malaya and Singapore. So the Japanese killed tens and thousands of ethnic Chinese perceived to be hostile to their new regime. And they, then they seized the key oil production zones. But ally, the Allies had sabotaged these zones, so it made it difficult for the Japanese to get oil production going right away. Well, the tide started to turn in 1942 to 45. Japanese military strategists were keenly aware of the unfavorable discrepancy between the industrial potential of the Japanese Empire and that of the United States. The Japanese reasoned that their ability to win would, would be dependent on rapid attacks right after Pearl Harbor. But in May 1942, failure to decisively defeat the Allies at the Battle of Coral Sea, in spite of Japanese numerical superiority, equated to a strategic defeat for Imperial Japan. This setback was followed in June 1942 by the catastrophic loss of four fleet carriers at the Battle of Midway. The first decisive defeat for the Imperial Japanese Navy. It proved to be the turning point for the war as the Navy lost its offensive strategic capability and never managed to reconstruct the critical mass of both large numbers of carriers and well-trained air groups. The Australians defeated the Japanese Marines in New Guinea in the Battle of Milne Bay in September 1942, which was the first land defeat suffered by the Japanese in the Pacific. Further victories by the Allies at Guandalas Canal and New Guinea with the Empire of Japan on the defensive for the remainder of the war. 
during 1943 and 1944, the 6th United States Army, led by General MacArthur, lands on Lake. In the subsequent months during the Philippines campaign, the combined United States forces, together with the native guerrilla units, liberated the Philippines. 1944, the Allies had seized or bypassed and neutralized many of J Japan's strategic bases through amphibious landings and bombardment. This, coupled with the losses inflicted by Allied submarines on Japanese shipping routes, began to strangle Japan's economy and undermine its ability su to supply its army. By early 1945, the U.S. Marines had wrested control of the Ogasawa Islands in several hard-fought battles such as the Battle of Iwo Jima, marking the beginning of the fall of the islands of Japan. After securing the airfields in Saipan, and Guam in the summer of 1944, the United States undertook an intense strategic bombing campaign using incendiary bombs burning Japanese cities. And this was the beginning of the end. What we can gather from this incendiary bombing campaign, which cultivated with the nuclear weapons dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki is um, everyone in the World War II committed atrocities not just the Germans uh, the Russians the United States the British the Japanese everyone um, war has a heavy price 